Hi colleagues, uh, welcome to DINCAST, the Disruptive Innovators Network's short series of leadership interviews focusing on all things disruptive and innovative. Enjoy. Welcome everybody, uh, welcome to the Disruptive Innovators Network's uh, first DINCAST and I'm delighted that uh, I'm joined today by uh, Stephen Carver from uh, Cranfield School of Management. Um, and we're here today to talk about resilience in a crisis. And uh, it does seem that uh, we are in a bit of a crisis here as, as, uh, at this moment in time. So, um, Stephen, uh, you've always been one of my favorite speakers ever to sort of work with, but would you like to sort of tell people a little bit about yourself? Oh, okay, and literally just one minute, because these things are boring. So, uh, yes, I have an unusual mind, as they say, simply because of where I've come from. I was trained originally as an engineer, very much X plus Y equals Z. I used to build oil platforms. And then Pat Melvin did an MBA, uh, stands for Master of Bugger All. But basically there I learned that my change skill um, that I'd learned in the oil business could be applied anywhere. So I then went off to work for Virgin for two years, and that really cemented my ideas of change is opportunity and that you don't always have to have a plan which was completely the opposite to the way i used to think then i went to work for a big um, uh, halliburton a big uh, oil services company I learned a lot about corporate life decided i didn't like it set myself up my own business made money out of banks and along the way the university got hold of me and said would you like to be a university lecturer um, I said no initially, but actually it's been great fun. So now I balance my life between working at the university with some very clever academics who come up with all the clever ideas, and I push them out into industry and see if they actually stick. So that's me. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, we're having this conversation now because we are right in the middle of a, a what's called an unprecedented crisis that we've got no reference points to sort of grow um, to go from but i just wondered you know you work a lot in crisis management and you know i've seen a number of your presentations about lessons from disasters within sort of the oil industry and things like that um but we've had crises before and we've survived them is this one that we're currently going through now really that different not really except for scale obviously normally when you have a uh, a crisis on this scale it's a country or a large organization and the rest of us can help or, or criticize or whatever but now we're all in the same crisis at the same time which is really very unusual so we're not spectators on somebody else's um, we are very much now all a part of this crisis and that is unusual and it's bringing out the best in people and also the worst in people so sort of having agreed that we've sort of been through um, crises before and whilst this one is on a, on a vastly sort of different um, scale, um, for, you know, speaking to some of the, the leaders within um, my network and that, what, what, are you, what would you sort of say would be some of the key actions at this immediate point in time those leaders should be focusing on? Okay, well, the first thing I always say and I always teach this when I teach crisis management um, is something the military taught me a few years ago, which is this expression, stopper, uh, S-T-O-P-A, uh, and then I have an extra R on the end. But let's just quickly talk about that. The first thing you should ever do in a crisis is stop. Now, it sounds counterintuitive. You've got a crisis. Everybody wants to rush around saving the day, being Superman, putting on the, uh, the red underpants, the rest of it. But really, that normally makes it all worse because you're just going with adrenaline. You're either fighting or flighting, or even worse, just freezing. So just stop. Give yourself some peace and some calm, even if it's just for a few seconds, um, and try and re-engage your brain, get some oxygen up there, and kind of go, whew. So once you've stopped, you can now engage your brain and think, and hopefully think uh, in a more positive way, apart from fighting, uh, which is very difficult to do with this particular crisis, um, or, or running away, well, we can't run away from it because we're all breathing it. Freezing isn't really a good option either. So think. The O is the orientate. Orientate yourself to the people who are going to be affected. Now, as leaders, you'll be um, thinking about people who are frightened. In this case, um, it's, it's a disease. 
can't see it, can't fight it, or the experts say we can't do anything. And so people are frightened. And so they are to be very much into the, the adrenaline phase. And you've got to be ahead of that. You've got to calm them down, you know, keep calm, carry on all those good things. But you will not be dealing largely with rational people. Now, some of them will be wanting to fight it and, and in terms of I can do this, and I can do that. That's fantastic. Grab, grab, grab that positivity, but just try and channel it. Otherwise, it just blows out very quickly indeed and achieves nothing. So that's the S, the T, the O. And by the way, um, the orientation, we saw an example last week. People in such a panic. I could die of this disease. What shall I do? I'll run down the supermarket and buy as much toilet roll as I possibly can. Now, this isn't exactly an intelligent response. I just love to know what these people are doing with their toilet rolls in their houses. But there you go. But that was a classic case of a leader saying, hey, come on, really, do you need to do that? Next one is P, plan. Now, planning is always seen as we should do this and stick to the plan. No, planning is a state of mind and it's a loop. Uh, often you will say, well, we can try this. Let's see what happens. And in this case, fast failure is completely acceptable. Not a problem. We plan to do this. Let's try it. Didn't work. What did we learn? Move on. The A is the action. Okay, you throw yourself into it. And as I said, you learn quickly by what you do. And then the R at the end is review and possibly repeat because the crisis would have moved on again. So mostly it's about staying calm, but most people unfortunately aren't calm at the moment, and as we can see are behaving in sometimes very bad ways indeed. Yes, and, uh, and again, we've seen lots of examples of how companies are, from a reputational point of view, handling this really well or, or not, as, as the case may be. And it'll be interesting to see what sort of um, uh, retribution, if, if, some, if that's the right word, will be, um, will be taken on those organisations. Now, you, you've, yes. you've, done a, you've worked with lots of, sort of leaders and companies across the world, and I just wondered whether um, you could give us some examples of some of those leaders, good and bad, how they've handled crises of, of their own. Obviously, they won't have handled something of this scale. And, and what, can, you know, what, what have you learned about you know, how they've made those decisions? Um, having worked, um, I'll give you an example from Virgin. Uh, whilst I was working there, I wasn't involved in the rail side at all, but they had an accident. Uh, an old lady sadly killed on a Virgin train. And it was interesting to see all the experts immediately saying to Richard, right, you know, say nothing, getting the lawyers in, you know, the candidates, this could ruin your business, all the rest of it. Before they'd even done the investigation, he was straight out on television saying, this is our train, there's no point denying it, it has our name on the side, uh, I represent the company, um, our hearts go out um, to the relatives of the lady who's been killed, um, and he just did the classic, he showed connection with people, number one. One, show that you're a human being, not just an accountant or lawyer reading from a script. Second thing he did was he said, look, we don't know at this stage why this accident or this bad thing happened, but I'd like to thank all the accident investigators. They're all here and whatever they recommended, you know, we're, we're going to help them all the way. Um, and then the remedy. And the remedy, he said, at this point, obviously, you know, there's very little we can do. The emergency services are doing what they can do, whatever we can do. That's great. Now, all the people that uh, were around him, especially the lawyers were saying, that's a very foolish thing to do, Richard. Um, the liability could destroy your company. And he said, no, that's the right thing to do. Now, as it turned out, it wasn't their fault at all. Um, they were completely exonerated. Um, it was the track operator who was at fault. And so, as you said earlier on, people remembered that and mm -hmm. thought, there's a guy who did the right thing. And it turned out it wasn't his fault anyway. So in many ways, he doubled uh, his, uh, shall we say, um, appreciation and followers. So doing the right thing um, in the long term. And as you already mentioned, a lot of companies now are reacting in the short term, very clever on the balance sheet, very clever legally. But I think in the long term, it's going to catch them out because people will be discussing this for decades to come. Already the business schools are gearing up all their case study houses. And so companies that do the wrong thing at the moment, I think are just going to be... Um, saddled with a burden that they will probably have to bear for decades, if not longer. 
And one thing I'm, I'm keen to sort of explore um, is this term resilience. I know you've written and presented on this before. So, so what does resilience mean to you? And, and have you got some examples from some of the companies you've uh, researched or worked alongside that you could share? Yeah, uh, we did a major piece of work at the university on resilience. And it was fascinating to see even what people thought resilience was. Some thought it was just toughing it out. Some people thought it was just um, you know, armor plating the company. Resilience is the ability to rebound. And that's certainly what the world economy is going to do after these tragedies of this year are over. Because it will be over. It will burn out. There's no doubt about that. And then we'll be faced with, yes, a changed world. And one where we can actually move ahead very rapidly. I know people talk about the V. I don't think it's going to be a V. It's going to be more of a, a bathtub. But it will rebound. Uh, we are very resilient as a species. You've seen what people have done in the last week or two. It's been phenomenal what has been achieved. I'll give you a quick example on that before I talk about the results. But um, have you seen what the sages have done today? There they are making sports cars or whatever. Mm. And they've got together with the University in London and um, basically they said we can come up with an alternative to ventilators much cheaper to make uh, and we said no you can't do that you're a sports car manufacturer no we can do them we can do them as of next week we reverse engineered it um, we can give you a thousand a week as of next week and people say no 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 you have to go through all the regulations you have to go through all the committee meetings and they said no here it is it works would you like it and there's almost this feeling of well you shouldn't have been able to do that well, they have, they're resilient, they're smart, they're doing the right thing. And once you unleash people, I think that's what they've done. They've said to their people, hey, what can we do? I think um, most companies are amazed at how resilient and creative people are in a crisis. Now, to answer your first question, um, the research ground field, we, we came up with four types of company and organization that were resilient. One was the dodo. Um, the dodo, very successful by the way, for hundreds of thousands of years, lived on an island, everything was good, every day was the same, and they were big fat flightless birds with no predators. Everything was great, but then one day a ship appeared, and the dodos thought, what the hell's that? So uh, the sailors came onto the beach and killed all the dodos, and within a year all the dodos were dead. Some companies will be like that, they'll say, this isn't happening, there's nothing we can do anyway, and they will go extinct having been successful for many years in a no-change culture. The next ones are what we call the herd. These are ones who are horribly aware of the whole situation, but are now panicking, and they are stampeding, often in the wrong direction, uh, and not taking the time to think and orientate. Now, they move with great speed, and they look like they're achieving a lot, but actually, they're probably doing the wrong thing in the wrong way, and often will just go off a cliff and that's the end of them. The third type, hey, um, we are very good at what we do. We have very good lawyers, very good accountants. And by the way, I'm not knocking lawyers or accountants, but hey, you can't touch us. We can fire our staff and you can't touch us. Uh, and we'll get all the government grants and you can't touch us. Well, we call them the tortoises. They're gonna go back into their shells. They are going to survive and survive their will. But afterwards, the world would have moved on because they only move slowly. And whilst they're in their shells, they're not moving at all. And so the world will pass by them. And in many ways, they're writing themselves slowly out of history because things will move on much faster. The fourth type, we call them uh, basically the, the swarm intelligence or whatever you want to call it. And we use this analogy of a flock of birds and a predator comes in and the flock of birds seems to just absorb the crisis, absorb the danger. Uh, and they all seem to act as one. And there isn't one leader telling them what to do. They all just behave collectively in the right way and are therefore resilient. Fish do the same. And human beings do the same, providing they calm down, providing they unleash the potential that they have in terms of their intelligence uh, and their attitude. So the four types, and we're rather hoping there'll be lots of swarm fish types around. Um, there always have been, and there always will be, uh, and it's nice to see them uh, doing well. So yeah, Mercedes, a good example this morning.
So, so having talked about, you know, the, the dealing with the now, getting through the day kind of thing, as, as you've mentioned, we will come out of this at some point. Oh, yes. um, and what do leaders sort of need to be thinking about now? Because I suppose part of the risk is that you would spend a lot of time just get, say, getting through to the end of the day, managing it is now. But actually, I would imagine that, you know, there will be some organisations looking already now at what are the opportunities that we need to be preparing for. Absolutely, it will be a different world. Uh, some of it for the better, some of it for the worse, but it will be different. And so good leaders now are thinking strategically. And uh, as I said, there's no perfect answer. It's all unfolding day to day, but giving yourself the headspace away from all the emails and the Zoom meetings and everyone panicking and just thinking, yeah, where could we be when this settles down? What could we be doing? I don't know. Mercedes might actually invent a new product line in medical services or something. Um, and it's this unleashing side. Um, I think this is a phenomenal opportunity to push back against what I would call over governance. It's something, as you know, I've kind of gone on about for the last four or five years. Um, I've worked for many organizations in the past that have done amazing things, but I've seen so many companies over the, I reckon, the last 10 years slowly end up in what I call learned helplessness. I can't do this because the governance won't let me. Again, I'm not knocking compliance or governance, but it has now actually got to the point where it's stopping innovation and stopping hope. And so I'm rather hoping, dare I use that word, that this present crisis, an example, I've already given you people like Mercedes, people just crashing through this and saying, we can sort this. Dyson, another one, you know, fine, vacuum cleaners, uh, they suck, well, respirators, they blow. It's all about air movement, we can do it. This unleashing of potential is phenomenal. Uh, and to give you a, another company as an example uh, that I do case studies on, um, it's someone like SpaceX. Now, people say, so what, you know, silly little boys and, and toys and rockets. Not really. SpaceX launched 60 satellites last month to add to their 300 they've already put up. Uh, by the end of the year, they'll have complete broadband coverage over the whole of the North Americas, within four years, probably over the whole world, which makes 5G look like a bit of a joke, really. And so how have they done it? They've done what people like NASA used to do, which is get lots of young, talented, and enthusiastic people and unleash them on a problem. Uh, human creativity is a phenomenal thing and perhaps we'll get back to the roots of being human which is creativity we've touched on a bit about um how this is changing the way that we look at the, at the world of work you know we've had lots of organizations and people rushing to work agile and work from home and all of the issues um, around that but i'm not convinced that that's going to be the new normal stephen that as human beings um we like that interaction and the human contact that no matter how good some of the technology is at this stage um it just doesn't replicate that so what are your views on how the future of work is is going to pan out once this crisis is over okay and i agree absolutely um in many ways it's been very positive in the people are now picking up video conferencing and as you said they don't have to commute so much that's good for the environment uh, we've seen already with the air Perhaps that's going to clean up our air and perhaps we should be thinking about charging more for flying and, and things like that to try and reduce uh, global pollution. So there will be a positive side. Uh, and so the uptake of things like this video conferencing and Zoom, which I think has been a long time coming. The science has been there for several years, but people haven't used it. So now they are. That's brilliant. It's pushed them over that little lip. And so now they're using it. Will it replace normal working? No, it won't. You're absolutely right. We are human. Again, this wonderful thing. We are not machines. It's not just about data. It's about um, being in the room with people um, uh, uh, and the human interaction. Again, that's where our wonderful creativity comes from. And yes, things like this can help support it. But yeah, we're not all going to end up uh, in our little uh, offices at home um, just doing Zoom meetings. I certainly hope not anyway. Absolutely. Well, I think on that note, Stephen, uh, we wanted to keep these sessions short and sharp and uh, to the point. Uh, I'd just like to thank you very much for your um, contribution and discussion that we've had there today. I'm sure people will find that really, really useful. Um, uh, so thank you very much. My pleasure. And on a final note, I'll quote Mr. Stephen Fry. I, I don't know if you know his wonderful story about Pandora's box. And by the way, it was mistranslated. It was Pandora's bars. 
and the thing opened and all the evils went out into the world and that's the world we now live in. In fact, the end of the story is slightly different from that because there's one thing that didn't escape uh, from the vase and that was hope. And I think that's something we need to hang on to at the moment and we'll be very hopeful. I'm sure we'll survive this.